Hi, good afternoon to everyone. I'm Dr. Michelle Kao. I'm one of the nephrologists here in Island Hospital. I'm going to give a talk to all of you today, and the title of my talk today is Chronic Kidney Disease, What It Means to You. Okay, a topic which is very pertinent, very important to many. Okay, let me first start by uh, introducing myself. I obtained my medical degree from the UK, from University of Dundee in 2000. And I went on to do my training in Dundee itself and obtained my specialist degree, MRCP, from Edinburgh in 2003. I went on to specialise in renal medicine in the east of Scotland, mainly in Dundee, Aberdeen and Edinburgh. I spent a few years uh, specialising in renal transplants in the biggest unit in Scotland, Edinburgh Royal Infirmary. During this time, the UK, I also took a few years out to carry out a research which led to a degree of Doctor of Medicine, which I got it in 2010. The title of my research was The Effects of Allopurinol on Endothelial Function and Left Ventricular Hypertrophy in Chronic Kidney Disease. The findings of this research have been presented in many international meetings and it won the highest European prize in the European Renal Association in Munich in 2010 and I won the best abstract by a young investigator in the field of clinical nephrology then. I obtained my specialist certificate in renal medicine in 2011. During my time there, I was also a lecturer and examiner for the University of Dundee and the findings of my research was in fact published in the top renal journal, Journal of American Society of Nephrology. And I came back to Malaysia in 2013 and I've been practicing here in Island Hospital ever since. So, before I go on to talk about chronic kidney disease, let me just uh, run through briefly um, about the role of our kidneys, where it is and what it actually does. The majority of humans, uh, of us, we have two kidneys. It's located in the mid-abdominal region and it's towards the back. And it's connected to our bladder by two tubes known as the ureter. The bladder, the function of it is merely just to store urine. And there's also a smaller tube here, down here, which is known as the urethra. Basically, the differences between the male and the female in terms of our urinary system is that the male has a longer urethra and also they have an added organ here, which is known as the prostate. This is another diagram that looks at our kidneys, closer view. So this is our right kidney and our left kidney. And these are the blood vessels that are connected to both our kidneys. There are also two organs sitting on top of the kidneys known as the adrenal glands. This is the right one and this is the left adrenal gland. So now that we know where our kidneys are, let me run through what our kidneys actually do. So uh, what it does is that the kidney removes waste and excess water from our bloodstream. Okay, These waste and fluid are combined together to form urine. And many of our important body functions are actually dependent upon the proper functioning of our kidneys. Okay, So in order for our kidneys filtering process to work properly, first thing is that the blood pressure must be right. The blood flow to our kidneys must also be adequate. Okay, In other words, for example, if the arteries leading to the kidney are not healthy, then the whole filtering process will be affected. Secondly, our kidneys are made up of these small units, okay, which we call it nephrons. The nephrons are made up of a glomerulus and tubules. Okay? They combine together to form nephrons. And our kidneys are made up of millions of such uh, nephrons. All right? So for the kidneys to be healthy, these nephrons must be healthy. In other words, the other thing too is that the path from the nephron to the urethra, the whole path must not be blocked, okay? So when the kidney filters are working properly, what we get is a proper balance of fluid and chemicals in the body. 
But then if an imbalance occurs, many of such critical or importantly important bodily functions would then be affected and it will start to produce symptoms associated with kidney disease. So I've run through, this is another diagram that looks at the kidney and its roles. I've already mentioned that our kidneys remove excess fluid. It cleans our blood, removing waste products which are not needed. It keeps the body chemicals in balance. But the other few roles that, are, uh, that, that, that patients are less aware of or they, are not, uh, they do not know is that number one is that the kidney is very important in controlling the blood pressure, okay? And secondly, it produces a hormone known as erythropoietin, which is essential to help build red blood cells. There's another role here which is not mentioned, okay, is that the kidney helps with the metabolism of our bone. So now that we know what normal kidney does, question is, what exactly is chronic kidney disease? Because this is something that I see day in, day out patients presenting to me. Chronic kidney disease or CKD, or in other words, kidney failure, is actually a condition in which the kidneys lose the ability to remove waste and excess water from the bloodstream. And as the waste and fluid accumulate, the body systems would then be affected, and this would potentially lead to complications. And remember the words chronic, chronic disease as a medical term. It just means any long-lasting condition. It does not necessarily mean that it's a very serious, a severe, or immediately life-threatening condition. Okay? It actually rarely means dialysis because only a small minority of patients with chronic kidney disease actually end up needing dialysis or a kidney transplant. So, how common is chronic kidney disease? Okay, it's actually quite common, more common than you actually realize it. It's known that it affects as many as 1 in 10 of the general population. In other words, 10%, okay, 10 of people have underlying chronic kidney disease. Although, let me emphasize again, the majority of these people have mild kidney disease okay, or mild kidney damage. This is another diagram that looks at the global prevalence of chronic kidney disease amongst the elderly. So if we were to take those patients between the ages of 65 to 74, it's estimated that one in five men, or in other words, 20% of men, have underlying chronic kidney disease. Or, and this is in fact more common amongst the women. One in four women or 25% of women have underlying CKD. If we were to look at the population of those above the age of 75, this is in fact even more common than you realise. It's estimated that half, 5 out of 10 folks above the age of 75 actually have underlying chronic kidney disease. So we know that it's actually quite common. The next thing we want to know is who are those who are more likely to get chronic kidney disease? Well, to be honest, anyone can develop chronic kidney disease. But we know that it's more common with people who are of advancing age, those of South Asian and African Caribbean origin, patients who are known to have underlying hypertension, diabetes or heart problems. And we know that chronic kidney disease can be caused by an inflammation of the kidney or those with past history of repeated urine infections and those with family history of kidney disease. This is another diagram to emphasize what I've just said. It's more common amongst those with high blood pressure, diabetes, and heart problems. Those of advancing increasing age, those with a family history of chronic kidney disease, and also those who are more obese. Why? Purely because they are more prone to have high blood pressure or diabetes, and those who smoke. Why? Because it causes hardening of the arteries. Now that we know who are more susceptible to developing chronic kidney disease, we want to know what exactly the symptoms of chronic kidney disease are. Well, sadly, in most people, the early stages of chronic kidney disease actually do not have any symptoms whatsoever. Sometimes there are none at all until a few weeks before dialysis. It's said that it's possible that one can lose as much as 90% of the kidney function before experiencing 
any symptoms whatsoever. This is why I constantly tell patients it is in fact a silent disease. But if someone does develop, develop, uh, does develop symptoms, it usually occurs in the latter stages. They tend to feel more fatigued, more tired. They have difficulty concentrating. They notice an itch which is difficult uh, to be resolved even with medication. They notice that their ankles start to become more puffy or more swollen. They get more breathless on exertion. They lose their appetite and they begin to lose weight. And they begin, begin to feel more and more nauseous. Even when the kidney failure or the kidney impairment is more advanced, the majority of people still make a normal or near normal amount of urine. This is very confusing because uh, the majority of patients, they actually associate the amount of urine with the severity of their condition. They will come to see me to say that, but doctor, I continue to pass normal amounts of urine. Yes, to these patients, urine is being formed, but it does not contain sufficient amounts of the body's waste products. In fact, these patients often develop high blood pressure and uh, they tend to develop blood chemistry abnormalities and the symptoms associated with it. They tend to be more anemic, which, which result in fatigue, breathlessness, and also a bony ache associated with underlying bone disease. Of course, these symptoms can sometimes be caused by something else, but it just means that they need an extra checkup to be sure. So how do we actually assess the kidney's function? There are a series of tests that we can do. Of course, we do blood tests, urine tests, and we scan the kidneys, whether by using the way of ultrasound, CT, or an MRI scan. Blood tests. There's a parameter that we look at known as the glomerular filtration rate, or GFR. What it does is that it gives an approximate measure of the kidney's function. In other words, we actually use it to monitor the severity of the kidney impairment. And the commonest way to estimate the GFR in any patients is by measuring the blood's serum creatinine. Okay? Because once we know the creatinine level in the blood, then we can use to estimate the level of GFR by using a formula. What the GFR uh, literally means is that the lower the GFR, the worse your kidneys function, okay? And if the GFR improves, it means that the kidney function has improved. For those patients who have known chronic kidney disease, a stable GFR simply implies that the disease is stable. And using this GFR, the... Uh, what nephrologists have done is that they stage the level of kidney impairment. There are five stages in total, stage one right up to stage five, okay? Stage one being a very mild form of kidney impairment and stage five is the worst or what we call uh, advanced kidney failure, whereby the majority of patients will be on dialysis. Urine. So what do we look at when we check someone's urine? The main thing we look at is for the presence of albumin or protein, okay, because it's a marker of kidney disease. Small amounts of albumin in the urine, what we call microalbuminuria, may be an early sign of chronic kidney disease, especially for those with underlying diabetes and hypertension. Blood in the urine is not normal. It should not be there. And if someone finds blood in the urine, this has to be investigated further. Then thirdly, we, Im uh, we use imaging um, tests to look at the structure of the kidney, whether it's an abdominal ultrasound or a CT scan. One, we need to make sure to see if the patient has two kidneys. We want to ensure there are no stones, no growth, and also to make sure that the structure is not blocked. There's no obstruction to the whole structure. Lastly, there's one test that sometimes nephrologists do or carry out, which is known as a kidney biopsy. Okay, This is done under ultrasound guidance. It's actually a very small procedure um, that can be done just by bedside. All right? 
whereby a small piece of the kidney tissue is removed and then is examined under a microscope by a pathologist. What the biopsy helps us to do is that it gives us definitively what the cause of the kidney disease is. And also it gives us other information like the level of severity. And if there's inflammation of the kidneys, it tells us uh, whether the, uh, the inflammation is aggressive or uh, is pretty mild. So chronic kidney disease is not a black and white thing. It's actually a progression, okay? It goes from being normal, uh, it goes through a process of normal down to kidney failure through a process. So at any one time, we can actually detect kidney disease, okay? It doesn't just go from here to here overnight. So the next question is, will chronic kidney disease get worse, okay? Kidney damage is usually permanent, okay? But most people with kidney disease will find that it gets worse very slowly. And the main goal of treatment is actually to prevent the progression of chronic kidney disease, okay? So what we try to do is to uh, prevent it from going to renal failure completely. And the best way to do that is firstly to diagnose it and to control the underlying cause. Only a small uh, number of people, a minority of people, will get much worse and will eventually need dialysis or a kidney transplant. How do we manage chronic kidney disease? As mentioned, the first thing we need to know is that once we've determined that a patient has chronic kidney disease, the first thing we need to know is what the underlying cause is. Because some of these causes are actually reversible. In other words, um, if we were to remove the cause, there's a high chance that the kidneys can get better. That means they can go back to normal. For example, if you can identify that it's the use of some medications or if the uh, structure of the urinary system is blocked or whether the blood flow to the kidneys are impaired, if we were to identify these causes, sometimes uh, this is reversible and we can actually improve the kidneys function. High blood pressure or hypertension, in fact, is found in 80 to 85% of patients with chronic kidney disease. And the main thing for these patients is that we need to maintain a good, a good uh, control for them. Because by controlling the blood pressure, it actually slows down the progression of chronic kidney disease. The other thing um, that we do is that the majority of these patients in the advanced stages, they tend to be anemic. They do not have enough red blood cells. Why? Because as I mentioned, uh, our kidneys produce a hormone known as erythropoietin, which helps to stimulate the bone marrow to produce red blood cell. So what we do is that once they've reached an anemic stage, we give them medication to try to improve this and we help to change their diet. Okay. The main thing is salt restriction that will help uh, to improve their condition. The other Dietary advice that we normally tell patients is that uh, some of them, need, um, the majority of them need to go on a low protein diet. Some of them need to go on a low potassium diet, low phosphate diet, and etc. And other treatments that we do is that the majority of these patients, they have a higher what we call cardiovascular risk. So we identify this risk and we try to lower them down. Okay, for example, their cholesterol, if they are smoking, we ask them to stop smoking. If they are diabetics, we tighten their blood sugar control. And for those uh, minority of patients whereby they continue to progress on to stage 5 or they progress on to a level whereby they need uh, to be on dialysis, then we prepare them towards dialysis or even kidney transplant. So, in terms of dialysis, there are actually two forms of dialysis or what we call renal replacement therapy. The first modality is known as hemodialysis, hemodialysis or HD. Okay, This is the uh, more common mode of dialysis. The patients, they go to hospitals or dialysis centers three times a week, usually four hours each time. They are hooked to a machine whereby the blood is drawn out from their body into a machine and the waste product, excess salt, excess fluid are removed, and blood that has been cleansed is returned back to the patients. Okay, so this is known as hemodialysis, which is the more common form in Malaysia and the majority of the world. There's another form of dialysis which is known as 
uh, peritoneal dialysis or CAPD. Okay, in this form, there's a tube which is inserted into our abdomen because our abdomen is a huge cavity. So what happens is that we fill the abdomen with a type of fluid. Okay, usually a dextrose form of fluid. Let it dwell inside for a few hours, and during this time when it stays in, the process of dialysis will happen because our abdominal wall contains a lot of blood vessels. So waste product, excess fluid, excess salt will be absorbed into the fluid, and then after a few hours, we drain it out into a bag, and then we fill in with a new um, bag of fluid, and then this process happens all the time. And usually patients are able to carry out this form of dialysis on their own if they are trained to do so. And if it's CAPD, it's done four times a day. And for some patients who are fortunate to obtain a machine, they can in fact carry it out at night. The machine will, will do the job for, for them. Okay. The third form is um, kidney transplant. In fact, um, this is probably the rarest form, but actually the most effective way um, to overcome somebody's kidney failure. So what happens is that we take the kidney from a donor. It can be a live donor or a diseased uh, person, and we implant it here. We do not need to remove the original kidneys. The original kidneys are normally left in there, although they are not working. So we only need to transplant one kidney and it does the job enough for the patients to live a normal or near normal life without dialysis. So what are the benefits of kidney transplant? Okay, well, um, it's a surgical procedure whereby a healthy, as I mentioned, a healthy kidney from a live or diseased donor is placed into a person, okay, whose kidneys do not work anymore. The main thing is that we need to ensure that the kidney that we take from the donor needs to be a healthy healthy kidney free of infections okay and uh, what we normally do is that we work the patient up to make sure that the patient himself or herself is healthy is free of infection free of any underlying uh, malignancy is healthy enough to undergo this surgery why do we advocate for kidney transplant well because it offers a much better quality of life okay you do not need to go to the dialysis centers, sit down there for hours for dialysis, or you do not need to carry out the dialysis yourself if you're on CAPD. And we know that the overall mortality or the risk of dying is much lower for those patients who have had a kidney transplant. And in terms of dietary restrictions, it does, um, it's so much freer for these patients because whether you're on hemodialysis or CAPD, there are, there are many dietary restrictions that you have to adhere to for the rest of your life. And in the long term, the treatment cost is actually much, much lower because you do not need to pay for weekly uh, regular hemodialysis sessions. You do not need to pay for the bags for your CAPD. Um, for transplant, the main cost is just to uh, continue with the medication to reject, um, to prevent rejection. And kidney transplant is actually something that Island Hospital is able to carry out. We are fully licensed. We have a capable transplant surgeon who is able to carry it out. And myself who and um, other members of the team who are able to look after yourself. So what we see is actually what we call the tip of the iceberg. Patients who present to us is actually just the tip of the iceberg. As I mentioned in my earlier slides, chronic kidney disease is a lot more prevalent. There may be some of you listening who are sitting at the bottom here, completely undetected, underlying renal impairment. And unfortunately, kidney disease is something that is growing, not in a linear fashion, it's what we call in an exponential fashion. That means uh, each year, we see more and more patients presenting with kidney failure requiring dialysis, okay? And this is the same phenomenon, not just here in Malaysia, but in almost every country. So the question is, where do you start? Well, it all began, it begins with you. You need a simple blood test. If you suspect that you have underlying kidney problem, get your urine dipped 
and also to consult a kidney disease. But ultimately, the initiative starts with you because if you stay at home, you do not see anyone, you do not consult anyone, no one can help you, no one can check your blood or your urine. And for those of you, what can you do? Well, regular exercise will help because it helps to bring the blood pressure down, it helps to uh, reduce the risk of diabetes, keep the weight down, don't smoke, avoid excessive salt and alcohol intake, okay? And with your doctor's help, we, can, we are able to help you to uh, control your blood pressure and your diabetes much better, check your cholesterol level, and make sure you take the right balance of medications. Thank you so much for listening. Okay. Uh, do we have any questions from the audience here today? If you don't have, um, there are a few questions that some audience have written in prior to this. One of the questions is, how will I know if I have kidney disease? Okay. As I said, this is very difficult because it is a silent disease. If you have any of the symptoms that I mentioned, the easiest way to know if you have kidney disease is you get your blood test done, you get your urine checked out, and you may even need a scan of your uh, kidneys. Okay, That's the easiest way to know because if the blood test and the urine are completely normal and the ultrasound scan shows a pair of normal kidneys, then you know you are, you are fine. But at any stage, if you picked up some abnormalities, whether it is your blood or your urine, then um, that's we can work from there on. Okay, it's never too late. Another question that was posed to me is: What kind of food should be avoided in trying to prevent kidney disease? Okay, as I mentioned before, the commonest cause of uh, kidney failure is diabetes and high blood pressure, okay? And what sort of food will predispose you to that, okay? Um, salt, uh, sugary stuff, excessive carbohydrate, oily, uh, fatty food. So these are the things that we should try to avoid, okay? And the other thing that I've, I've emphasized uh, constantly to patients is that they need to drink adequate amount of fluid. So to summarize, avoid salty food, Avoid uh, too much of carbohydrates and sugary stuff. Avoid too much of oily, fatty food, okay? Because what we are trying to prevent is diabetes, hypertension, heart problems. And please drink adequate amount of fluid. And the last thing is that avoid unnecessary herbs or traditional um, supplements. Okay, one of the questions posed to me by Natasha is why does the iron drop for dialysis patients and even with iron tablet the iron remains low why does this happen this is a very good question as I mentioned um, patients with advanced kidney disease are more prone to anemia from two reasons the main reason is that uh, the kidneys cannot produce erythropoietin for so for, for this group of patients what they actually need is an injection of erythropoietin on a regular basis to keep up with the uh, EPO level. But there's another reason why um, there's another reason why they are also anemic is because they become what we call iron deficient. Okay, They become iron deficient, deficient for a few reasons. Number one is because the absorption of iron in these patients becomes very, very poor. The Our intestine is not as good in absorbing iron even if we constantly take the iron tablets. So, what we do for these patients is that we always advise an injection of iron on a regular basis guided by blood tests, okay? And secondly is that, uh, to be honest, although they tend not to lose blood, but there's always a small loss of blood. These patients are also prone to bleeding. So, when somebody bleeds, they lose iron at the same time. But the main reason why they become iron deplete is because uh, the absorption becomes very poor. So, even if they, they are relig religiously compliant uh, with their iron tablets, the absorption is not as good. They need to keep up with a regular iron injection. Okay, I hope that answers your question. There's another question here. Um, someone has us is I go to the bathroom very often and does that mean my kidneys are failing? 
Well, it doesn't mean that your kidneys are failing. Um, it just, but it needs to be checked out, okay, for a few reasons. Number one is that we know that patients uh, with poorly controlled diabetes or uh, who do not even know that they have diabetes, okay, for example, they tend to go to the urine more, uh, go to the bathroom more often to pass urine. Or patients who develop an underlying urinary tract infection, they tend to go to the bathroom uh, more frequently. The third thing is that uh, they may have an inability to uh, pass urine uh, completely. That means they do pass urine, but it's not complete emptying. So there's a problem with the bladder itself. Or for some males, it just means that their prostate, they may have underlying prostate problem. The prostates have enlarged and is giving them this problem. But it doesn't necessarily mean that um, the kidneys are failing, but it still means that they need to be checked out. And at the same time, a simple blood test to look at the kidney function. Okay. One more question that's come to me is that, um, how do I know if my kidneys are bad? Well, very easy. We just need a blood test, okay? As I said, a blood test to look at the creatine level. That will give you the information that you want. In other words, you know the level of your kidney function. But at the same time, not just blood tests. We look at the urine to make sure, um, to look for any presence of protein or even blood. And also scanning the kidneys will give us some information because in the advanced stages, okay, the kidneys will start to uh, shrink. So... The kidneys do not look as healthy and they tend to be smaller than usual. And this is usually a sign that the kidneys are not as good anymore. Okay, let me see any more questions coming in. Okay, someone has asked this. <clears throat> How long can I live with chronic kidney disease? Well, um, as I said, the majority of people with chronic kidney disease have the mild uh, have very mild form of chronic kidney disease. In other words, they, um, the main thing that determines uh, how long they live is actually the other conditions, like if they have underlying diabetes, hypertension, and heart problems, because um, that actually would determine how long they live. Because if they were to die, they are more likely to die from a cardiovascular cause rather than to die from kidney disease, okay? But for somebody with known chronic kidney disease or very advanced chronic kidney disease requiring dialysis, if the person goes on dialysis, of course, it will afford them to live longer than somebody who has advanced kidney disease and yet refuses dialysis. But ultimately, if somebody, even if he or she has uh, advanced um, kidney disease requiring dialysis, um, but if he or she looks after her health well, that means um, if they are uh, mainly free of high blood pressure diabetes, these people can actually live pretty long even with uh, dialysis. I still remember when I uh, left the UK, uh, the longest patient that I have under my care, he was on dialysis for 32 years and that was in 2013. So... Uh, for all you know, he, he he's still alive. So, if that person knows how to look after uh, his or her health, despite dialysis, he can actually live a near normal life. Yeah. One more question. Can I still have a good life if I'm diagnosed with end-stage renal disease? Well, being the optimistic person that I am, the answer is yes, of course. Okay. Well, to look at it, the other way is that if you have end-stage kidney disease and you refuse dialysis, then uh, that's essentially, you're, you're unlikely to live on, okay? Your lifespan is a lot shorter. You may die anytime. Well, with end-stage kidney disease, if you go on regular dialysis, yes, uh, it is an inconvenience, but it's something that many patients, you'd be surprised, they actually live and adapt their life around it, okay? I have patients continue to work, okay? They continue to work actively, they continue to have uh, a good family support. They continue to go on travels, to go on holidays. Although, yes, they need to restrict their diet, but they have learned to adapt okay, their life around it. And, and in, in their eyes or in their opinions, uh, they actually live a relatively good life. Okay? Um, I mean, if you were to speak to them, they say that, well, um, I never thought that I could live the way I am. 
um, compared to when I was first diagnosed with end-stage kidney disease. So I think it all depends on the type of person you are. If you tell yourself that I will live on, uh, I will just adapt my life around uh, this condition, then yes, you can lead a fairly good life, okay? Next question is, how can I keep my kidneys working as long as possible? If uh, we have a healthy pair of kidneys, it's very easy, okay? We try to avoid the kind of conditions that I mentioned, okay? Try to reduce your risk in developing hypertension, high blood pressure, diabetes, uh, heart problems, okay? So in other words, we need to keep a healthy lifestyle, healthy diet, exercise regularly. We need to eat food which are not bad to us. We need to avoid medications, unnecessary medications or medications that are not good to our kidneys. We need to drink plenty, okay, to keep our kidneys hydrated. For those patients who already know that they, they, they have underlying chronic kidney disease, what do they need to do? Well, it depends on what the underlying cause is, okay? So if you have diabetes, hypertension, heart, you need to see your doctor on a regular basis to keep all this under control. Okay, you need to avoid unnecessary medications. If you were to see a doctor, you need to mention that your kidneys are not good just so that he or she will avoid giving you medications that can cause further damage to the kidney. Any more questions? Okay, one more is, if I were to donate my kidney, how will it affect my life? Okay, for those donors, the main thing is that uh, we will not, if, if this is done uh, in the legal proper way, okay, if this is done in the legal proper way, the first thing is that the doctor in the first place will make sure that, number one, you are a suitable donor. In other words, you have a pair of healthy kidneys. If at any one point we detect that one of your, 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 your kidneys are not healthy, we will not advise you to be a donor, no matter how uh, enthusiastic you are. Because number one is that we need to make sure that you are healthy. We need to make sure that you have no infections, you have no hypertension or high blood pressure, you have no diabetes. We need to make sure that the plumbing of your whole kidneys, uh, the, the, the plumbing system is normal. So, in other words, um, you will go through a series of assessments to make sure that you are healthy. And in fact, a study has been carried out many years ago. They looked at, um, they, they, they study and look at a group of kidney donors and how they fare in their life and all that and compared it with a group of normal individuals who have not donated their kidneys, okay? After comparing like with like, what they found is that those patients who have donated their kidneys, in fact, they live a longer life. Why? Purely because um, these kidney donors, okay, what they actually do is that because they know they only have one kidney, they tend to take their health more seriously. They go for a regular medical checkup. Um, they make sure they avoid all the wrong things that I've mentioned before. So uh, it, it doesn't actually, what, what, what will happen in the initial stages is it's just that you need to be admitted to the hospital, you need a surgery, you stay off work uh, for two weeks or so. And after that, you lead a very normal life, all right? Next question is, how is blood pressure related to kidney function? Actually, um, it works both ways, okay? As I mentioned, the kidneys actually help to control the blood pressure uh, for two reasons. Number one is that uh, the amount of salt being excreted because salt plays a big part in the control of our blood pressure. So the kidney uh, maintains a good balance of the salt in our body. The second thing is that the blood vessel in the uh, kidneys would dilate and contract according to our blood pressure to try to control that. Okay, And at the same time, it works the other way. A high blood pressure would definitely uh, cause our kidney function to drop, to fall. Why? Number one is that it causes hardening of the blood vessels supplying to the kidney. In other words, uh, if we do not control our blood pressure, with time, the blood vessel hardens up, less and less blood goes to our kidney, is being supplied to our kidneys. Number two is that uh, it causes our kidneys to work a lot harder. What we call the filtration rate goes a lot higher when our blood pressure is high. 
similarly, if the blood pressure is low, it's too low. Okay, if the blood pressure is too low, it's very simple. What happens is that there's not enough blood being supplied to the kidneys, and our kidneys cannot function properly. Any other questions? Okay, there is one more question here. Um, I kind of mentioned that earlier on, but um, this question is, are there any medications I should avoid if I have chronic kidney disease? The answer is yes, okay? The main group of uh, medication that one should avoid is the type of uh, painkillers known as NSAIDs, NSAIDs or non-steroidal, okay? This is the main group of uh, medication that one should avoid, okay? Because, um, uh, this is something that I see very commonly in my practice. Patients coming in, uh, showing me their blood tests, um, telling me that uh, the kidneys went from normal to abnormal uh, in the space of a few months. And when you were to question them further, we know that it's actually due to the uh, painkiller that they have been taking. Okay, Some people are just more prone to developing kidney impairment even with uh, a few doses of such medication. Then another uh, group of medication would be certain types of antibiotics, okay? Certain, um, they, they can actually cause damage to the kidney, okay? And if, um, it, and it all also depends on um, their heart condition. For example, if somebody has heart failure, and if we were to give medication that lowers their blood pressure too much, then yes, it will cause the kidney function to go down even lower. Okay, but the main thing is a group of medication, a type of painkillers known as non steroidals. All right, any other question? No, it's been a, an enjoyable afternoon. Thank you so much. Let me emphasize again your kidney health is actually in your hands. Okay, nothing is too late, and, and nothing spells the end. Okay, even if someone here is listening with advanced kidney disease, it doesn't mean the end. We can always make our life to work around. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening.